Okay, here's one that's actually a little bit related uh, to, and, and, but, uh, to what Neil was just talking about, but I think it, it, we can expand on it. I've always, Anita says, I've always wanted to be an astronautical engineer, but I am horrible at math, but I've got lots of passion. Can this dream ever be a reality, and where do I start? So it's an interesting, you know, I guess I'll start with that. I mean, I think, math, as, as Bill said, you know, math is the language of science, and I think you... you you have to be able to ha be adept at it. Math is the language of the universe. Yes, you're right. I agree with you. Brian? I agree, but, 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 but let me just finish and then we can... Uh, uh, that too many people think that um, you have to be a mathematical wizard to be uh, even a physicist, I mean, much less an engineer. <laughs> but... Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it takes all types. Uh, I know people who won the Nobel Prize. I know people, y y you don't have to be the best mathematician in your class. You don't have to be a whiz. It takes all types to do science. And that, well, any stereotype just doesn't work. If you're interested, do it. What's that have to do with you knowing Nobel laureates? Who, who were not the best in their class. Oh, fine. Thank you. Okay. I, I mean, who weren't necessarily even that strong in math. Okay. But the other thing, I'll just say, you say you're bad at math. I bet you're not that bad. And I just want to remind you that there's, when it comes to math, there's no substitute for practice. It sucked for me. It sucks for, I mean, you just have to practice. So when you come to me, you come to me and say, oh, I'm bad at math. I am open-minded, of course, but skeptical. I'll bet you can do it, whoever you are. You know, that's an important point. We, we, we were talking about it last night, too, that, and, and it touches on what you said. You know, I like science museums because often because they show science is fun, but science is, is hard work, like anything, to do, like music, like anything else, to do it well. And it takes a lot of work. So you just, and if you don't enjoy it, you can't do the work. But, but just enjoyment alone isn't enough. You've really got to be willing to work at it. I think what's really going on here is people presume that in order to be good at, in order, they presume that if the math is not coming easy, that therefore you'll never learn it. And, uh, and I meant it literally that math is the language of the universe, and it's like any other language, especially a language that does not share the Roman alphabet. So, for example, if you wanted to study Chinese, it looks completely intractable at first. It looks like Greek. It, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, and you can ask the question, how long does it take one to become fluent in Chinese? if you're not Chinese yourself. And so it can take years, and five years, almost 10 years, if you never go to China. You go to China maybe five years of intensive exposure, and you've never done that with math. Imagine that level of exposure to math, what kind of fluency you would have at the other end of that pipeline. So at least give yourself the opportunity that any person learning a foreign language would give themselves before you turn around and say you're not good at math. Brian, you... <laughs> get me started. Yeah, you don't want to get him started. I, mean, I, I know that from experience. Um, you're actually the only. You're a professor of math as well as as well as physics. Probably the only one on the table. Yeah, and the question here. that comes to mind for me is, how do you know that math is the language of the universe? I was going to say, what about I, the multi? The universe told me. <laughs> Pretty okay. good first approximation, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, okay, we're now doing but, science but by you, revelation. Lawrence, but, before you go, yeah. I'm just wondering, because I, I have a question about this. Uh -huh. Could you imagine that one day far in the future we encounter some alien civilization and they say, hey, show us what you've done to understand the universe, and we bring out our math books with all our theorems and physics, and they turn to them and say, math, we tried that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it takes you just so far. <laughs> <laughs> And the real way to do it is like this. I would say that whatever that real way is, it's well, not it manifest to us at this moment. And until that day happens, where an alien tells us how backwards we are, all I can say is that the math that we did invent out of our human brain, as you surely know, Eugene Wigner said, the unreasonable effectiveness, effectiveness of mathematics in describing the universe, the fact 
that it works at all is sufficient enough for me. But, you, but, but, no, but I'll, I'll, here, I want to I wanna, I wanna have a no. It's just because, me. wait, it's just because you still can't figure just out your string bigger. theory. Okay. Back in your don't come corner. to Get crying to me. Back in your don't come crying to me. You can't figure it out. Well, in fact, you got him started. See, you got him started. Said, don't get me started. Don't get him started. <laughs> no, but I want to go on record. He warned a, you not to get him started. Yeah, I know. I told you. But I want to go on record. I want to go on record, and this is a momentous occasion. I want to go on record as agreeing with Brian. Um, <laughs> is anybody but, uh, keeping the record? But no, in the sense that uh, it is fascinating if you're a theoretical physicist to wonder when you find something fascinating, whether uh, at math some mathematical formulas are fascinating whether it's a property of our brains or whether it's a property of the universe. And, and we just don't know, I think, the, is the answer. We, if you stri if string right, theory but, but straight, let me ask you a question. Yeah. I find it slightly confusing because, Neil, you describe math as something that we create. So why is it the thing that we create is somehow intrinsic to the universe? Isn't that awesome? our description. It's a, it is, awesome it's a awesome. awesome. surprise. It, I don't, it's a surprise. Description. I don't lose sleep over that. I celebrate it. It's a good thing. I, I celebrate it too. Yeah, but but but, the, the question, but it is a question. There may be limitations yeah. in understanding the universe because of the way our brains work, and I think that's uh, surely the and, case. That's yeah, surely. And, the and, case. and for Republicans, it's already happened. But it's uh. uh <laughs> it's, 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 but but um. Uh, no, but seriously, that's an interesting question, and we, you know, it, it, we really have to wonder about that. And if you're, again, uh, working, as, as some of us are at the forefront of physics, we, you wonder at some point when, when it's going to end. It's some Republicans. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but to the questioner's question, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't worry about the possibility that it, mathematics is going to turn out to be ineffective in describing the universe and use that as a reason to not keep practicing. <laughs> <laughs> press on. This That's right. Be, okay, next question. Could be an engineering perspective. Yeah, no, there you go. Excellent. Next question um, from Joel. What do you believe or hope will be the most significant scientific advancement over the next few decades? And I, I, have, I know I have a pat answer to this, but I'll wait to see if anyone else has one. No? We don't okay, know okay. what the next most significant exactly. scientific discovery is going to be for crying out loud. Exactly. <laughs> The point I always say, if I what knew what I Why are you guys exploring Mars? What are you going to find there? We don't know. That's why we're going. Yes. Explain that loud. Great. And, and as a... Wait, 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 wait. wait. Okay, That's not go fair. On. It's no, not wait, wait, wait. No, there are two kinds of exploration. One of them is, I have no idea what I'm looking for. But maybe I'll find it when I see it. Okay, another, kind of, uh, another kind of... Another kind of explanation... Can't, you, you can't argue with him. I've learned it. It's another really kind of exploration yeah. is we think we know what's going on and we want to test our hypotheses. That's another kind of exploration. And one of them is, is there life somewhere else? We know there's life in at least one place in the universe and that's called Earth. So what I want to do is go to the the, the frozen surface of Jupiter's moon, moon Europa, cut a hole, go ice fishing down there, put a submersible, see if something swims up to the camera, camera and licks the lens. That's what I want to look for. Yeah. Look for life. Life. But Neil, you are looking for something. When was the last time you just went, I hope to discover something. <laughs> oh, you're always looking for something. No, but whenever we it's look for bad. something, we are often surprised. And I think that the point is that if we really could anticipate the progress of science, it almost, in some sense, wouldn't be worth doing because it we, we, means we'd already kind of know where we're going and what the answers are. And I think that, so when people ask me, what's the, what's the next great thing? I say, if I knew, I'd be doing it right now. And uh, so I think there is this sense we are driven by questions, interesting questions, but often, those questions lead us to answers that lead to more interesting questions that are totally different than the ones we came I up with. I say not just often, but most times. Yeah, I so I think that... But you, but you can say something about the question which you really would wish to know the answer to. And, I mean, for, for me, it would be, what, what's consciousness? Oh, because yeah. because that's, that's totally baffling. Scott, Richard, you know what I think? I agree. Not that you asked, but what I think on this is... Uh, consciousness has kind of baffled us for a while, okay? And evidence that we haven't a clue 
about what consciousness is, is drawn from the, in, from the fact of how many books are published on the topic, right? We're not really continuing to publish books, not really, on like Newtonian physics. It's done, all right? So, so the fact that people keep publishing books on consciousness is the evidence we don't know anything about it, because if we knew all about it, you wouldn't have to keep publishing. <laughs> so, so what I wonder, <laughs> what I wonder, Richard, is whether there really is no such thing as consciousness at all, and that there's some other understanding of the functioning of the human brain that renders that question obsolete. To that, I've got to say, like, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Okay. And am, I, am I like thinking, or am I just like thinking that I'm thinking? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Will you Richard, stop? Oh, right, right, sorry. Richard. We went, we went decades, we went decades not understanding the procession of Mercury. It was this big mystery, and we invented solutions to it, like a mysterious planet Vulcan tugging on it such that the, its, per, its perihelion processed. And, and that wasn't the explanation at all. It was uh, obviously general relativity, another thing, not the original question <laughs> we were asking. So you say you want to know what consciousness is, maybe that's not even the right question. How about okay. this? What's the nature of consciousness? Excellent. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> actually, I, Tracy, I think I want to uh, direct this one to you. Um, Who's you? To Tracy. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not Neil. I'll be happy. Okay, be okay. Happy. <laughs> um, okay, it says here, science has recently become somewhat trendy, popping up in the show The Big Bang Theory, or in I beep loving science on Facebook. Oh, she's here, she's here. I know she's here. here. The, okay. Often the focus is not actually on the science, but making entertainment out of science. Is this ultimately good for science, do you think? So I think you have a perspective on that. I'd like I, yeah, I do. I, I, don't, um, I, I don't think when it's done well, it's uh, diminishing the science or, or the scientists for that matter. I think that what is really spectacular is when you can take high-level science and apply storytelling and all kinds of things that we know help people learn about a subject. I mean, we learned in, again, broadcast news. I was with ABC News for many years. And if anyone said, well, we must do that story because it's very, very important, we knew that was just death because, you know, eat your peas journalism or eat your peas writing, you know, you must know this because it's important, is just, uh, it's never going to light a fire in people's imaginations, children or, or adults. So I, uh, I don't think it's turning, you know, entertainment is not a bad word. Uh, as long as you continue to uh, preserve and, and communicate the, the real stuff, the real science, uh, and that's the philosophy we, you know, we apply to this. We didn't want to do, oh, nod to science and then go off and tap dance. I mean, it was really engaging with the material, but recognizing that sometimes this stuff is really hard. And you need to write it well, act it well, and... Uh, and produce and it well. And I have to well. say, you do a great job of producing. I, I, I mean, you really do. Um, And, uh, I only, I, I only uh, wanted I to, I, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. All you have to look at is what is going on in this stage tonight. This is entertainment. I this, hope so. This is absolute <laughs> entertainment. I'm sitting here just watching. I'm, I'm ducking out of the way sometimes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm sitting here watching, and it's making a point about science and how to convey and how to make science interesting to the public. You're getting into these. This is, this I, is, I, yeah, I agree. This is how to do it. Did you, did you? I think fun and entertainment are overrated. <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're British. That's because you're British. It's, uh, no, yeah. no. It's okay. <laughs> People are more alike than they are different. Science is hard. 
but it's worth it. It's fascinating, it's enthralling. But if we only talk about the bits that are fun and make bangs and smells and things, then we, we don't do science justice. I, I was once... Um, I mean, I, the, we, we use the phrase dumbing down, <gasps> and, and we, mustn't, we mustn't do that. Um, I, I once gave a speech at a, at a British conference um, ab about the uh, public um, communication of science, and I was ranting against dumbing down. And at, at the end, some, some man got up and said, this is not an exaggeration, this is a true story. He said, maybe we need dumbing down in order to bring women and minorities into science. Oh, no. <laughs> we're going we're to get there, because there are a few questions about that. In fact. Right. <laughs> That's why we fought a war to get out of England and start a new country. <laughs> I have, to say, I have to say he was booed in the original. Okay. Yeah, okay, good, absolutely. And we actually, speaking of that, we're gonna have, we are going to have Larry Summers here at one of our events next year, so you can ask him about that, if it, any of you know about that. But anyway, um, the, question is, uh, the next question is, many of you are involved or aligned with the skepticism movement. How do you keep an open mind scientifically without using skepticism as an excuse for inaction? Can a person be a product, proactive skeptic? I think that's an interesting question. Are you question. kidding? I knew you'd so, uh, well, I think, Lawrence, uh, correct me, but people c confuse, and the modern word that's been made up is conflate the word cynicism with the word skepticism. Yeah. It's two different words. Yeah. But I mean, I know not uh, a lot of young people, but one is uh, you're not going to pay any attention to anything. You just think everything's screwed up and uh, nothing's ever going to work out right. That's cynicism. But skepticism is... You're presented with evidence, and you do your best to uh, draw conclusions based on that. So, as the saying goes, uh, I am uh, Bill Nye. Do you believe in ghosts? No. Uh, however, I'd love to see one. I'm bring it on. <laughs> so, I am open-minded to the idea, but I... The more I look into it in the skeptical frame of uh, way of thinking, the less likely it seems. But bring it on. When I was young, <laughs> the universe was slowing down. Well, it turns out that's not, right? Mm -hmm. Do I run in circles screaming? Or do I go, that's cool. <laughs> but I do want to know why. Yeah. And Well, you know, and, and I think that's the point. It's being wrong is really the most exciting thing in oh, science. Man. And in fact, as I often say, you know, when I debate people, speaking of skepticism, there are people who don't accept the fact that evolution is a fact, and I've spent an undue amount of time in this country talking to those people, well, talking to, <laughs> talking to school boards and others and government trying to... Get, which I want to applaud. But yeah, anyway, but... But, 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 but there's, this, there's this illusion that we somehow have this pact that we shake hands when we get our PhD, we're, you know, we, evolution, no, can't question it. And, you know, we want to be right. And the people don't understand that the, the way to become successful is to prove your colleagues wrong. That's the way to become a, a well-known scientist, is to make a discovery that proves wrong. So if there was something better than evolution, if it didn't work, you know, you'd be, Richard would be the first person to want to try and, and discover it, in a sense, because it would mean we'd learn something, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we can add something to that, which is that um, there's a, a, an attitude in the culture that says that everybody's entitled to their opinion, and you've got to respect their opinion. No, you damn well haven't got to respect their opinion. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, you, you know that's, a, that's a great segue, because... Uh, because <laughs> there's an opinion of Neil's that I, I don't like. And, um, <laughs> really? Boy, knock me over with a feather. Right? Hey, actually, he's going to say it's not an opinion, but let me, ask, let me ask this, jump to this question. Bring then. it on. Yeah, <laughs> I figure. Okay. Do you, uh, do you think the privatization of space travel is a hindrance to the long-term goal of deep space exploration? It should have happened decades ago. And... Uh, it, 
No. And, and, okay, and actually, I, I agree with you in that sense because, well, I'm not sure decades ago, I think the government had to be involved to learn how to get things going. Uh, I, I don't think... Decades don't, ago, we knew, how to, yeah. we knew how to go in and out of low Earth orbit since exactly. 1962. That's right. So, that's, that's decades ago. That's right, and that's not deep, that, but that's not deep space exploration. But I think you're absolutely right. The private industry is a perfect place to do low Earth orbit because... Yes. Uh, and not NASA, because it's boring and dull, and, it, and oh, it's... Yeah. No, you, and, can, and, you can generalize it. It's not simply that private enterprise is for low Earth orbit. Private enterprise is for anything where the risks have been pre-assessed yeah. by the government investment in the frontier, which is why I think where NASA should live, on the frontier, on the moving frontier. And, and at, as that frontier moves, it leaves behind routine. It leaves behind certain needs of the, of the activity, and those needs would then uh, be a void filled by private enterprise who would surely do it more efficiently than any government enterprise can. But the frontier, where it's dangerous, it's expensive, and all the risks are unquantified, you combine these through three, you cannot establish a capital market valuation of that frontier, and so, therefore, government has to take the first step if you're going to do this at all. And, and that's why the, the, the post office doesn't have their own postal planes. You rent space in the belly of Delta Airlines because they can do it more efficiently. Yeah, no, well, that's, 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 but that's, that's, true of, that's true of all science. Medicine is the same way. Business is not going to step in and do fundamental research. NIH is going to do it, and they're going to take that risk. And it's, you can apply it any big risk. In fact, it's really important. In our, right now, people are saying, well, you know, you've got to fund science that has immediate application. But in fact, the government is there to fund the research that no private industry is ever going to fund because the benefits are a generation away. But in fact, 50% of our gross national product comes from fundamental curiosity-based research a generation ago. And the only way to do that is with the government. Correct. Now, we're all agreed with that, but the thing where we may disagree, and I'd be interested to see, because uh, actually it'd be interesting because you're the Planetary Society, and I, I wonder whether Brian agrees with me on this, because I think most, many scientists like me would say the frontier doesn't involve people. The frontier oh. that NASA is doing in space, the, most in, the real science that NASA does, doesn't involve 100-pound bags of water. I didn't say science. Okay. I talked about No, no, I want to... Okay, There's a distinction here. Yeah. If you only want to do science in space, yeah, you, you would never send humans. You, you agree. would send robots. Even the geologist who would love to go to Mars with the yeah. hammer would just love it. If you gave the geologist the option, I can send you to one spot, or I can send 100 uh, spacecraft, uh, uh, spa uh, 100 rovers. Rovers, rovers to 100 different spots that you can pick. They're picking the 100 rovers. No, actually, that's not true. I'm in the Department of, of Geology, among other things, and, and uh, many of my colleagues there disagree and say they they think a geologist could do in a little while what rovers could do. I happen to disagree. I think. <laughs> no, no. Did you tell them 100 rovers, yeah, I 100 did. different spots? I did. You know what? I told them. Okay. I told them the real number, which is probably a thousand different rovers, because you okay. can send. Let me finish for a second, Neil. Um, uh, they, they, you can send, as I often say, you can send a rover to Mars for the price that it takes to make a movie about sending Bruce Willis to Mars. Mm -hmm. and, That's right. And, and, well, this but is if, you, if you told if you told the geologist it was a one-way trip. Which is what I've I, I argued But they for, still you know. want to be going. They still want to go. Yeah, they, then they're, they're just crazy. I mean, just, no, why are. are you even talking to those geologists? Well, so you guys, just if I may speak briefly about the Planetary Society, we are fighting the good fight to restore funding <laughs> for planetary exploration. We're trying to get one and a half billion a year, so we need 300 million for planetary science, and it's, in, it's being threatened. Uh, so fiscal year 14 is coming up for NASA. If you've got nothing else to do, please check out planetary.org and consider supporting this, because our claim is uh, science is what NASA does best, and planetary science is the best of that. And so we really would like you all to consider supporting it. It is such a good value. It is such, it's such an amazing value, so uh, consider. And by the way, it's been estimated that what the rover does, built by our very best rover engineers, uh, driven by our very best rover scientists, uh, uh, rover drivers, uh, <laughs> who are influenced by our very best scientists. What that does in a week 
a human geologist can do in about a minute. Yeah, but yeah, if, I, I agree, so, but the no, human no, geologist, so there's the cost. It, it's not going to run to 100 different places on the planet. In fact, actually, the human geologist, I think, most often, is not going to make it alive to the planet. Well, I mean, so and, on and so on. But yeah. this is where you see it's, instead of 10,000 to one, it's got to be like a billion to one. So we'll get there. The longest journey starts with but a single step. No, but uh, the other thing, the other thing I want to, like, I, I may, let's stay on this topic for a little longer because oh, it, it, I, I maintain the reason people are interested in humans traveling in space is because they can die. That's what makes it interesting, and you want to see if they're going to die. <laughs> and, and, um, I and, but, that, you know, and, and, but I... thought that was NASCAR. But, what? I thought that was NASCAR that you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, but, but I find... <laughs> But let Lawrence. me ask you a question. I find it... Lawrence. Okay, well, when, so I'll ask you this question. When I see a picture from the rover, I, I'm more excited about it that, from coming from the rover than if it came from an astronaut taking the picture. Because the astronaut's using a camera, but the rover is taking the... It's part of the rover. Let me tell you why that's okay. probably not true, even okay. though you think it is. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> most people don't know that there were robots as well as rovers on the moon... Mm -hmm while we were first going to the moon. But you didn't know anything about those because the media focused on the astronauts. And it's the astronauts through which we gain vicarious access to space because they have mouths, they have brains, they have a childhood memory, they have school teachers that can talk about those astronauts. And I've yet to see a ticker tape parade for a robot. So I submit to you that Wait. if at the same time the Curiosity rover landed, if at that same time a human astronaut landed on Mars, you would have known nothing about the Curiosity rover. Yeah, but, it would have been relegated to page 30, and the front page headlines would have been humans put footprints on Mars. And it's that force which will bring less science than the robot that has a power of influence yeah. on our culture that inspires an entire generation to want to do the same thing. My, my generation, my generation, when you ask my fellow scientists, should we send humans into space? No, that's too expensive, send robots. Yet they, I said, well, how did you get interested in space? Oh, because of the Apollo program. And I slap them. I'm saying, what are you... No, that's it. <laughs> no, there would on, be... On the, other, on the other hand... On the other hand, if you, if you remember, if Apollo 13 hadn't been the dramatic failure it was, they would have canceled the rest of the Apollo. They canceled three of the last missions. There, yeah. there were three. There were three Apollo. There are three Saturn V rockets lying on the ground around space, around the, the country, because they. It was so interesting that they they abolished the last three. No, that's, that's delusional, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> it's not. Not incorrect. That's the facts. No, no, no. You can argue with the facts. I uh, watch me. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, everybody like mentioned their book. It's time for me to mention my latest book. It's I don't think anyone mentioned their book actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my most recent book is titled Space Chronicles, but that wasn't the original title. The original title was Failure to Launch. But the the dreams and delusions of space enthusiasts. And the publisher says, oh, that's too, oh, that's too depressing. You can't have the word failure in your title. It's, but that's what it's about. What you just said is a complete delusion. It presumes that we went to the moon for science. It no. presumes that we went to the moon to explore it. But that's not why we went no. to the moon. We no, Brother moon. Neil, no, it is not. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> we went to the moon because we were at war. Sputnik was not just some orbiting spacecraft. It was a hollowed out intercontinental ballistic missile where they took out the warhead and put in a radio transmitter. The military knew this. That's what founded NASA. NASA's budget for science has, it averaged over all these years about 25%. The rest has been for geopolitical purposes. All right? So it's the I don't want to die driver in this world. That's why we spent all this money. And so the moment we learn Russia's not going to the moon and it's certainly not going to Mars, we cancel the program. It had nothing to do with public interest. Okay, now let me... It, 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 is, it is a... 
let, let me try. I, I got to pull let, back. Yeah, I'm you got to come in. But, but it is. A, uh, let me try and bridge that gap a little bit. I'm going to be uh, silent. Uh, um, no, you're not. <laughs> um, but uh, the, I think it's really important to point to point out that this is a political issue. And in fact, I, I, I me and Buzz Aldrin together so testified before the House Ex Science Committee on Space Exploration. And I, uh, when I said that that humans don't do science in space, I didn't argue, in fact, even before the committee, that we shouldn't send humans into space. We should just say wh honestly why we're doing it. We're doing it for adventure. That's why we're doing it. No, that's honest. not what funded hold it. Hold on, hold on. A no, that's, that's not true. See, you said no. you wouldn't talk. But, yeah, I did but, say that. Okay, okay. You, you can say that. No, no, but hold it's, on. It's no, there's, there's no there there, okay? <laughs> there, no. Just, just, just look at the history of everybody no, no. doing big projects, and it's never driven by exploration. It's never driven by science. It's never driven by curiosity. Not if it's big and expensive. It's driven by the fact that people don't want to die. So there's a war driver. It's also driven by the fact that people want to get wealthy. So no, no, hold money on. We have the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider. The large, do, you, do you know? Oh, no. <laughs> no. This proves my point. Yeah, this proves the point. Large Hadron <laughs> Collider. Uh, please remind me of the total construction cost of the Large Hadron Collider. I don't know, about 10 billion. About 10 billion. That is six months of NASA funding. So you call that big budget? Not here in America, it's not. Yeah, NASA's budget's about 17 billion. Doesn't go as far as it used to. No, so, so it's expensive, but not on the scale that we're talking about here. Okay. okay, the country shared that. That's, that's not big money. Okay. Big okay. money is a shuttle mission costs a billion dollars here. One I'm not saying half. it should cost that, but that's One what it half. does. And what, who, who writes those checks? It's people who do it for geopolitical reasons. Not because they care about science. Our super collider, the one that you would have benefited from, the, su <laughs> the superconducting super collider, <laughs> Started to get funding in the 1980s, wasn't it? 200-mile yeah. ring, it would have been... No, 60-mile no, 60, 60 ring. 60 miles down to the circumference. 60, 60 miles around, yeah. I thought it was 60 times Well, take high. it from me, it's 60. High? No, no, it's 60. Okay. It's better story with 200, though. Brian, 60. 60. Circumference? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay, I've been saying it wrong all these years. Well, like Never mind. Thank you. Never mind. Okay, no, so watch, watch. So, here's a super collider. We... America would have found the Higgs boson decades ago, all right? So what happens? The budget gets cut for reasons, oh, the cost overruns, right there. excuse me, okay? Yeah, it got cut in the early 90s. What happened in 1989? Peace broke out in Europe. All of a sudden, the physicist, who was the hero of the 20th century for making the bomb, is no longer viewed as necessary to national security. And so the, the project gets cut like that. Actually, you got it wrong. The project got cut, actually, for even sillier political That's reasons, right. which was the Texas congressional delegation voted the wrong way. And, the, and If we were still at war, that would have never come up. Okay. It's also the International Space Station, right? I mean, yes, that's, that's true. That's, that's, that's the top story. The bottom story is okay. we don't longer think Look, we're going to die. Okay. So what we've, let, let's leave this topic, but science and politics are, alas, inextricably mixed. And we, I think... And politics wins And every time. I think... What, what I would say is that it's vitally important for the public to understand what their issues really are so they won't be lied to by the politicians effectively and they can do, elect people to, to base policy on empirical evidence and not on ideology or anything else. <laughs>